Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. So, in the first three episodes of The Bad Batch, or as other Alan in the comment section calls it, The Dad Batch, there's been a very interesting and kind of low-key side plot developing alongside the main story. Emperor Palpatine has tasked Governor Tarkin with assessing the clone army for its long-term viability as the Empire's main military force. One of Tarkin's main concerns about the clone army is something that we routinely talk about on this channel. The clone trooper program is a cost-prohibitive relic of the past. Prohibitively expensive. Sometimes I wonder if the Disney writer room is watching my dinky little YouTube channel. A dinky little YouTube channel that we always film above the waist because I want to do a leg reveal once we hit a million subscribers. Anyway, Tarkin was also sent to Kamino to observe Clone Force 99 and test their combat abilities and loyalty to the new Empire. While Clone Force 99 showed that they were extremely capable on the battlefield, they ultimately failed the loyalty test when they refused to gun down Saw Gerrera and his partisans because they were also harboring refugees. So now it seems very likely that Tarkin sees the clones as mainly a stopgap measure until a new alternative is found. In the first episode, Tarkin already mentioned the prospects of using conscripts to replace the clones. But because conscripts are usually pressed into service, loyalty will still be an issue, and unlike the clones, they won't have inhibitor chips built into their brains. In episode 3, we finally meet Vice Admiral Rampart. He's in charge of Project War Mantle, which is essentially the future Stormtrooper program, which uses conscripted and volunteer soldiers to fill the ranks of the Imperial military. Rampart had already prepared his first elite squad of enlisted soldiers, and he makes a really big deal about the loyalty that comes from volunteers who willingly serve the Empire. This really confirms the Kaminoans' biggest fear. They're essentially looking at the prototype of the new army that will eventually cause them to lose their clone contract with the Empire. This could have disastrous consequences for the entire planet and species. Prior to the clone army contract, the Kaminoans were mainly known for their clone technology and genetic engineering. They would mostly fill out corporate or planetary orders for clone labor that was usually used in dangerous situations like mining or security forces. But Kamino was never a bulk or mass manufacturing planet for clones. It was always seen as a high-end boutique that creates extremely high quality clones. In Legends, for instance, you had alternatives like the Spartai cloning facilities, which created clones in a year. These clones were a lot dumber and less capable on the battlefield, and they also had a tendency to go insane while holding very dangerous weapons in their hands. The Spartai cloning facilities were essentially H&M, or one of those other massive clothing companies that just pump out cheap garbage. Kamino, on the other hand, was more like a bespoke tailor, like the Kingsman. And so when Sifo Dias approached Kamino for this clone army project, well, this really changed Kamino overnight. Count Dooku removed Kamino from all of the Republic star charts, essentially isolating Kamino from other contracts and potential clients. But that didn't really matter at the time. The clone army contract was larger than anything the Kaminoans had ever taken on before. And better yet, it guaranteed at least a decade of work with potentially many more afterwards. And so this contract also represented a huge investment by the Kaminoans. Not only did the project employ all of their existing cloning facilities and personnel on the planet, the Kaminoans probably had to significantly expand their facilities to meet the needs of the GAR. The Kaminoans were also given direct representation in the Galactic Senate, which was quite a rare honor. Most worlds were actually grouped together in regions or sectors and then represented by a senator who could have as many as like a hundred or even thousand client worlds. And so Admiral Rampart and his Project War Mantle represents the greatest threat to Kamino. We're talking about the loss of almost the entire planet's economic output overnight. The cloning facilities were also staffed by thousands of Kaminoan scientists and workers, and the upkeep alone for this facility was staggering. Without any incoming revenue, they're basically screwed. And the Kaminoans, despite their very slender and docile nature, are actually ruthless barbaric animals. These were a species that survived the massive environmental disaster that covered their entire world in oceans. They survive by taking on some very drastic measures. They use genetic modification, and they also culled a huge percentage of their population that they deemed genetically inferior. It's no accident that these Kaminoans would also become master cloners and geneticists. The point is, you don't want to mess with the Kaminoans. They will do anything to survive. And it seems like Governor Tarkin and Vice Admiral Rampart are blissfully unaware of this aspect of Kaminoan culture. They seem to just casually discuss the destruction of the cloning program as if it has no effect on the Kaminoans at all. 
I guess in Tarkin's point of view, the Kaminoans don't represent much of a threat, but you know, Tarkin's kind of a pompous idiot sometimes. Tarkin reminds the Dolphikins that the contracts that extended the cloning program were signed with the Galactic Republic. And now since the Galactic Republic no longer exists, it means the Empire doesn't have to honor those contracts. Palpatine's new authoritarian military first regime could do whatever it wanted and anyone that stood in its way would be destroyed. Companies and planets that have tried to stand up against the Empire in those first years were either destroyed or nationalized. There wasn't even an objective or just judicial system anymore that could allow the Kaminoans to sue the Empire for damages after backing out of their contract. Well, what contract do you ask? Well, do you guys remember that time Separatist droids attacked the Coruscant Central Power Distribution Grid and created a blackout all across Coruscant? Well, in response, Kaminoan Senator Halle Bertoni, not to be confused by Halliburton, proposed an order for 5 million additional clone troopers. The Republic actually takes out a massive loan from the IGBC at a ridiculous 25% interest rate to cover it. This is a ridiculous piece of legislation that probably should have never been passed, but it was. But it just goes to show you how much the Kaminoans will lose if their cloning program is ended. Now, in the third episode of The Bad Batch, we see Nala Say and Lama Su have a conversation while walking around. They seem to really be worried about their predicament, and they also seem to have the beginnings of a plan. If your experiment can yield a superior clone, it will secure our relationship with this empire. Such a contingency cannot be created without a direct source. The clones required will not return willingly. So what do they mean by creating a superior clone and a direct source? Well, judging by the fact that they're looking at an empty lunch table where the weird kids usually sit, it definitely means they're talking about Clone Force 99, or perhaps Omega, because they do still have access to Crosshair, and he's pretty much a robot by this point. If they want to extract DNA from him, it'd be pretty easy to do. But then again, from what we know about Clone Force 99, they're definitely superior clones, but at the same time, their genes are heavily altered and mutated. I'd be surprised if more than half of Clone Force 99 is still fertile. So perhaps now I'll say and Lama Su are talking about Omega. We're not exactly sure who she is and where she came from, but I have a feeling that she's related to Jango Fett in one way or another. I mean, why else would they give Omega the worst English accent in the world? The same accent that Jango Fett had. I'm sorry, people of Kiwi Land. I really think you're some of the nicest people in the world, and your country is honestly the most beautiful place I've ever been. But the accent. Ugh. Anyway, guys, uh, the, the whole thing with Django Fett is this. It's either possible that he had a biological daughter, and that's what Omega is, or more likely, when the Kaminoans created an exact copy of him and created Boba Fett, a twin was born. Because in uh, in vitro fertilization processes, it's very common to have twins. So Omega might be the female twin to Boba Fett. Now let's say and Lama Su clearly are trying their best to keep Omega under the radar and out of the sight of the Empire. I believe she is the key to their plans. Another clue about why Nala Say and Lama Su are most likely talking about Bad Batch is when they reveal the clones that they need for their secret program will most likely never voluntarily return to Kamino. The Bad Batch clearly cannot return to Kamino as long as the Empire is here. Now let's say the Kaminoans succeed in creating their superior soldier. What next? Well, we know for sure that the clone program will inevitably end. By the time the New Hope takes place, most clones in the Imperial military have either died or retired. I'm pretty sure the Kaminoan plan to create like superior clones will fail. This is why the Stormtrooper is mainly made out of civvies in the New Hope. So what happens to the Kaminoans? Well, we've established what's at stake here and how desperate these aliens are for survival. And in Legends, the Kaminoans actually do create a secret army of anti-clone troopers out of the Jango Fett DNA. Kamino then has an uprising and it's quickly crushed by the Empire who sends Boba Fett alongside the 501st to suppress the rebels. Now Dave Filoni, who's uh, responsible for the Bad Batch and the Clone Wars and partly responsible for the Mandalorian, is clearly a huge Star Wars nerd and someone who appreciates the expanded universe and Legends content. He clearly knows about the Kaminoan uprising, and based on his past behavior, I think there's a good chance that the Kaminoans will also rebel in canon. Remember guys, Dave Filoni is the individual who bought back many legendary favorites, like the Clone Commandos and Thrawn. I mean, heck, there are even Clone Wars concept drawings of the Yu Zhang Vong. Unfortunately, that episode was scrapped. And if you take a look at the way things are going on in the Bad Batch right now, it makes sense that the Kaminoans would rebel. If the Kaminoans failed to impress Tarkin, 
then their people will suffer massive economic decline. Maybe the empire will even come and just take over the entire planet. This would be very unacceptable for these dolphinkin. And so I predict there most likely will be some kind of open warfare and Kaminoan uprising before the end. So there you have it, guys. That is my prediction of what's going to happen in The Bad Batch. I think there's a pretty good chance of this happening. It's probably like similar to, you know, Tom Brady going back to the Super Bowl next year. It's very likely. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.